Hello, hope you're doing well, and welcome back to Concept Corner! Yay! <laughs> this is the second time I'm making one of these, and the reason I'm dipping into this format again is because you guys really seemed to enjoy it the first time around. I didn't know what to expect when I uploaded that first video because it was basically me just rambling about my old characters for 20 minutes, but uh, I actually think that video has the most comments out of almost anything I've ever uploaded, and they're all really nice comments too, so thank you for that. Uh, seeing that kind of reaction and reading through all of those comments has been really, really encouraging. So yeah, quick recap, uh, last time around I talked a bit about one of my old shonen manga concepts called Heartless while redesigning the protagonist from that story. Now if you haven't seen that previous video, um, I'm gonna put a link to it on screen right now and I'd really recommend that you go and check it out before watching this one because it's gonna give you all the context you need about the story and the main characters and just a bunch of bits and pieces that I'm probably gonna reference in this one. Anyway, like I said, I've already shown you guys the main protagonists of Heartless, so today I'm going to be flipping to the other end of the morality spectrum and showing you some of the main villains. I've been very excited for this one, and if my various comment sections are anything to go by, so have quite a few of you. Uh, <laughs> so let's get right into it. Alrighty, now I mentioned last time that I first came up with the story of Heartless back in about 2012, but I think I should add a little bit more context to that before really getting into the meat of these designs today. While I did indeed come up with the overall concept and the main characters and the general plot structure for Heartless all those years ago, up until now I had actually never drawn any villains for it. I always knew at which points in the story a villain would be needed and what they would probably need to do for the plot, but yeah, for whatever reason, I just never put any more thought into who those villains would be in the grand scheme of things or gave any of them a visual design. Because of that, all of the characters and ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you guys today are ones that I actually only came up with over the past few months, after making that first Concept Corner video. So unlike last time, this isn't really a redesign process as much as it is just building some new characters entirely from scratch by throwing some ideas together and seeing what sticks. And the first of those ideas that stuck was the fact that obviously Heartless is a very shonen style concept, right? And in a lot of big shonen manga like One Piece and Naruto, there's always like a villainous or otherwise sort of far-reaching organization that the bad guys are a part of. So based on that logic, I thought, okay, in Heartless, the good guys are magic, they are witches. So the bad guys should be witch hunters. Just a big old group of witch hunters who want to get rid of all the magic because they don't like it. And I decided the name for this villainous witch hunting organization was going to be The Jury. Because, you know, you associate witch hunters with witch trials, and then, you know, trials have juries, and then that made me think of the phrase like, uh, judge, jury, and executioner, which would very much be the mentality of these people. You know, whenever I name things, it always turns into a game of connect the dots, but I think it's more fun that way. Uh, <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, while there would be various minor characters from the jury and other villains like the bad guy I mentioned Flint fighting in the last video, kind of dotted around here and there, these bad guys that I'm drawing today are basically some of the highest ranking members in the jury. They are the main, main bad guys. And our heroes would have various run-ins with them over the course of the story. At least, that's the idea. So, to start us off, let's begin with the most main villain out of this group of main villains. Uh, <laughs> his name is Alistair Creed, and he is the one in charge of this high ranking group. A lot of the time in shonen manga, the main leader of the bad guys will be like a really strong buff looking dude or just somebody generally more physically imposing, but I wanted this guy to look a lot more on the sickly side. Like at first glance, you wouldn't even think he could hold his own in a fight. Now it's at this point that I should probably explain one more thing about this particular group of villains. The reason that they are so high ranking in the jury is because even though they're not witches, you know, they hate magic, they aren't magically endowed like the good guys, they do all have certain abilities that make them really powerful and or useful in the jury's quest to eradicate magic. And Creed's ability is basically the power to nullify magic, among other things. So, you know, if he's going up against some magic users in a fight, it doesn't matter that he's physically weak and frail because his ability allows him to make his enemies even weaker. I think it always makes for a really interesting villain when they don't look particularly scary or threatening, but then you see more of them and realize like, oh, oh no, they're, they're evil. Uh, and I think that definitely sums up how I would want Creed to be as a character. 
The concept for Creed and his ability were actually partially inspired by some comments I saw on the previous concept corner, where a couple of different people suggested the idea of a bad guy with that kind of, like, magic nullifying sort of power. And obviously, if you remember, Heartless's magic is what keeps him alive. So I saw those suggestions and I was like, whoa, that is like the perfect opposite for Heartless. Uh, and, you know, that kind of villain power opens the door to so many possibilities. And, you know, ADHD brain, I kind of latched onto that idea and couldn't physically stop thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, hey, if you were one of those people who left one of those comments last time, thank you. Those suggestions really kicked my imagination into overdrive and I appreciate it. Anyway, in terms of visual design, I also wanted Creed to look like a really clear opposite to Heartless. Uh, like, you know, they're the main good guy and the main bad guy, and their powers and their motives are completely opposing. So to keep that theme going, you want to make sure that that's also represented in the way that they look. While Heartless looks energetic and wears sporty clothes, I made Creed look all grim and formal. I took inspiration from a bunch of different areas and themes for Creed's appearance. Um, overall, I wanted him to end up looking like a mix between a vampire and a librarian, while keeping that frail, sickly kind of vibe. Out of all of these villains, his costume is probably the one that most closely resembles a witch hunter in kind of the traditional sense, but that's mostly just because of the old-timey shirt and the shoe buckles. The main feature of his outfit, the big coat draped over his shoulders, was actually inspired by Howl from Howl's Moving Castle. I saw a picture of him while I was looking for references, and thought that the contrast between Creed's like pretty scrawny anatomy and a big bulky coat would be a nice combination. Also, there was another comment last time that pointed out the fact that all of the heroes from Heartless have some element of white in their costume, which is something that I honestly didn't even realize when I was making them. But having that pointed out made me decide to do a similar thing with the villains and have the color black be a staple feature in pretty much all of their designs. Because again, opposites. So, because he's the main main villain, Creed's color palette ended up being monochrome, with black as the main staple color. There is a lot more that I could say about Creed and his powers and his big evil plans and how it all fits into the story, or at least the story as I imagine it so far, but I think I'm going to keep that under wraps for now. So, on to the next villain we go! Next up is a big old creep called Doc. Um, I like to think that the jury's medical staff all wear those kind of plague doctor bird mask kind of uniforms, and the reason that Doc is wearing one is because he is either a deluded wannabe doctor, or he is like a mad scientist type doctor from the medical division who's just gone completely off the rails. Either way, I knew I wanted him to be the physically intimidating tank of the group, because you don't often see that with healer themed characters. And I figured that that kind of build would also make him look a lot more ominous when combined with the Plague Mask. I don't often really do tanky characters like this, so figuring out his anatomy was a pretty fun challenge. Now, much like how Creed is a direct opposite to Heartless in terms of, like, who he is as a character, I wanted the rest of these villains to parallel the other heroes in some way or other as well. Either by being direct opposites, or by being similar in certain aspects and acting as a kind of glimpse at where the heroes could have ended up if they'd taken a different path in life. In Doc's case, he is meant to be a foil to River. Where River is a nurse, he is a potentially self-proclaimed doctor. So, that's similar. But where River has sworn an oath to heal people, Doc is more motivated by his desire to hurt people. I played around with a lot of ideas for what Doc's power should be while trying to bear that harmful motivation in mind. At first, he was going to be just a full-on mad scientist and use machines and technology to fight, and then he was going to have some kind of plague-themed power to, like, emit poison and make people sick. And then I took that last idea and twisted it into something that I think is a lot more nasty, but definitely a lot more interesting. This might seem like a jump, but stay with me. If any of you have seen The Da Vinci Code, you might remember there's that one character who, like, whips himself and then prays about it, and is generally really intense. Um, uh, self-flagellates, I think is the word. Well, I remembered that, and I realized that that vibe is pretty much exactly what I wanted for Doc, so that fed a lot into his personality. Just fully unhinged, unpredictable, and devoted to his beliefs in all the wrong ways. And Doc's power, his witch hunting ability, ended up being inspired by that Da Vinci Code character as well, specifically the self flagellating part. Doc's ability is that he can transfer anything he's afflicted with onto other people. 
well, actually, I don't know if it would be anything or just the things that he does to himself, but basically he can rapidly cure himself of his physical wounds and sicknesses by transferring them onto his enemies' bodies, or as he calls them, his patients. Which is why you can see he's got some jars of poison on his belt there, and the dagger and bone saw. Pretty much he could take a quick gulp of cyanide or stab himself a little bit, and then make those wounds appear on somebody else while he gets to walk away without a scratch. I hope I explained it well enough there, because I'm not gonna lie, it's one of my favourite villain powers that I've ever come up with, because it's just so nasty. I can't think of another word for it, it just feels really evil. Which actually is pretty much exactly what you want for your creepy unhinged villains, so hooray! <laughs> anyway, like I said, obviously going around hurting people and making people sick is the absolute opposite of what River stands for, so I've been having a lot of fun imagining how a fight between her and Doc might play out. So much fun, in fact, that I actually had a bit of an epiphany and ended up changing River's design a little bit to allow her to use her own magic more effectively. I'll put the sketch up on screen somewhere now, because I, I, I don't know when else it'll be relevant to bring up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she has prosthetics now. Because if you remember, I mentioned last time that she can't use her magic on herself, on her own body, but she can use it on objects. So this was basically just another one of those little creative decisions that opens up a lot of really fun possibilities for the characters to, well, use magic creatively. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully opens up an opportunity for her to kick Doc's butt as well, because while I do think he fills the role of a villain very well, he is also very creepy, and I don't like him. Uh, <laughs> having said that, why don't we move on to a villain who at least looks a lot less creepy? This next one is a much more dainty looking villain called Lorelei. Uh, I'm not drawing these guys in any particular order, but if I had to rank Lorelei in terms of power and authority, I would probably put her as the second in command of this team right after Creed. And that is because even though she looks pretty innocent, she's actually got one of the most formidable abilities and sinister personalities out of all of these villains. I don't know if I'm completely sold on this idea just yet, but I've been thinking that by day, Lorelei is a reasonably well-known or even quite famous performer, who is also a very dedicated member of the jury on the side. And to tie in with her role as a stage persona, Lorelei's ability is one that I've been calling Siren, which if you're familiar with mermaid and siren mythology, you might be able to guess the details of. What it is, is that pretty much Lorelei can do anything and everything vocal, she can mimic sounds and other people's voices, she can hypnotize people, that's her main one, and when she needs to go on the offensive, she can sing or speak at a frequency that can shatter glass. And if you cast your mind back to the previous episode of Concept Corner, you might be able to take a guess at which of the heroes that last one would be a problem for. Lorelei is a very sinister character to me because she is the smiley type. You know, like, butter wouldn't melt, looks really innocent, puts on a public image of being this really pure goody-two-shoes, but with the jury, she would hypnotize people to forget things, or allow her and her colleagues to do horrible things, all with a dreamy kind of smile on her face. And there's something quite intimidating and unsettling about that. She's also very devoted to Creed, so she would probably do all of that and more with an even bigger smile on her face if he asked her to. Now, visually, I had intended for Lorelei to take inspiration from mermaids and opera singers, because that matched her power. But in the end, her design veered more towards ballet, and that was for no other reason than I thought that like that kind of tutu style of dress would look really pretty. Um, I think it's kind of fun the way that worked out though, because weirdly, it does still kind of suit her personality. She doesn't dance, she's a singer but she's also a master of lies and hypnotism and manipulating people's perceptions with her hypnotism. So it's kind of like, of course she would dress as something she isn't, that's, that's very Lorelei of her. For the little details, I also gave her a laurel wreath hair accessory, um, for no other reason than uh, laurel sounds like Lorelei, uh, and I just thought that was fun. And then, you might have seen it in the sketch for this one, but she was going to have um, like one of those big ribbons on the back of her dress, but I swapped it out for a sash that goes around her shoulders and curves down to make an interesting silhouette, because it reminded me more of that opera singer look that I wanted her to have in the first place. Also, I know that I mentioned before how I was intending to include the colour black in all of these villain designs, but Lorelei's colour scheme actually ended up being white and grey, 
I know it's blue here, but I ended up reducing the saturation of the blues completely after I stopped recording, so you're gonna have to take my word for it. Uh, <laughs> the thing with that though, anyway, uh, with her having this super pale good guy colour scheme, is that, you know, following through with the whole ballet outfit thing, it's kind of fun to imagine that she might have a costume change at some point and go all black swan. Kind of like she finally snaps and drops the smile, drops the public image where she's pretending to be good, and has a black dress that matches Creed's colour scheme a bit more closely, and she just screams and shatters everything. I don't know, I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll uh, leave you with that mental image anyway, as we move on to the next villain. Now, I don't want to play favourites, but this next villain is probably one of my favourites, because he is, say it with me, morally grey! <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> the concept for this villain was actually one of the very first ones that popped into my head when I first started thinking of the kinds of antagonists that could appear in Heartless. And he is basically a self-serving, smooth-talking, Cheshire Cat-style character who is aligned with the main bad guys not because of any personal vendetta that he has against magic, nor out of any real desire to do evil, but more so just out of self-preservation and self-interest those are very much his MO. He recognised that the jury was becoming more and more of a powerful force in the world, so when he received an offer to join them, he thought, sure, this could work out pretty well for me. And then because of his cunning and wily nature, he found himself with a position in this group of top-ranked witch hunters. Like I said though, uh, he's not quite as devoted to it as some of the other villains, uh, he's still very self-serving, so his loyalty can switch around depending on what's most convenient for him. When I was first thinking him up, I gave him the placeholder name of uh, Jacques, like, you know, the French spelling with a Q, uh, and I think that was just because at that point the only things I knew about him were that I wanted him to be jester-themed, and I wanted him to be French, and Jacques was just the first name that popped into my head. It didn't really suit him though, so once I finally found a moment to draw him in a bit more detail, I decided to go back and name him properly too. So, I return to my tried and true method of looking in a thesaurus for words that relate to the character that I'm trying to name, and after spending a bit of a while looking for synonyms for clown and trickster and a bunch of other stuff like that, I decided to call him Bandy. Bandy Bellamy. If any of you guys speak French yourselves, you might already know that Bellamy is a surname that means good friend or beautiful friend. Um, and I chose that name for him because it's pretty ironic. Uh, sure he's friendly and a flirty kind of character, but that doesn't make him trustworthy or a good friend by any measure. And as for his name, uh, it actually ties into his ability, and helped to inspire the specific details of his ability, in fact. I think it's most commonly used as slang here in the UK, but bandy is a word that means swap. So, if you bandy something about, that basically means that you're moving it around or tossing it from place to place. Originally, I thought up bandy as a teleporter. Just straight up, that was it, that was his power, he could teleport. But after naming him, I got the inspiration to fine-tune that power and make it so that he can still teleport, but he does it by swapping things around. Whether it be people, or objects, or maybe even things that are a bit more abstract, who knows? Bandy can swap stuff and most of the time he uses that power to act as the getaway driver to teleport the bad guys to and from different places. But he also has a lot of fun tricking people with it and getting them all turned around as well. It's a pretty fun ability to think about because of how well it suits his personality. Uh, like I said before, he's very much a Cheshire Cat kind of character who wanders about and peers in on things and snoops at things that he shouldn't really be seeing. So having a power that lets him come and go as he pleases works pretty nicely with that. Design-wise, like I said, he's based on a jester theme, which I think I chose because, again, he's just a very trickstery kind of character, but also because I just love that aesthetic. I gave him a jester's cap that takes a foxy kind of shape, and a twisty cape with a quilted texture that was absolutely inspired by Hypnos from the Hades video game. I've been playing that a lot lately, and the character designs in that are just... oof, very good. Uh, <laughs> To top it off, I coloured him in with a classic red and black Harlequin colour scheme. Not so much inspired by Harley Quinn from Batman or anything, that's just the colour that clowns come in, so he, he gets it too. Uh, <laughs> although for a while I did have a bit of trouble actually settling on that being his colour scheme and like picking a colour scheme for him, um, mostly because I wanted all of these villains to have colour palettes that meshed well with each other, 
while also matching up and complementing and contrasting in certain thematic ways with the colour palettes of the main characters. When I tell you I had the colour wheel out and everything trying to connect the dots and pick a colour scheme for this guy and the next villain without repeating any palettes and I just… ugh. A very large portion of my creative process is just overthinking, but thankfully it does at least usually pay off in the end. Most of the time, anyway. I think it worked out here, so I'll take that. <laughs> The moral of this segment, anyway, is that despite how long it took me to finally choose a colour scheme for him, Bandy Bellamy is a sly bastard and I thoroughly enjoy him as a character. With that in mind, let's move right along to the next one. So as you've already seen with the rest of these characters and like the little reference sketches that I have alongside them, I had managed to do at least one or two rough doodles of each of them at some point over the past few months before sitting down to draw their final designs for this video. But for this one, that wasn't the case. Up until the very day that I recorded this footage, this character only existed in my head, and I had never put even a rough idea for their visual design down on paper. I don't know why, I just didn't have the time. Uh, so I guess this would be the villain whose appearance was put together over the shortest amount of time, because it basically came together in a day. Uh, <laughs> Surprisingly though, I do actually really like how her design turned out, even though I put it together really quickly, and I think it lines up really well with the kind of mental image that I had of her up until this point. Although I hadn't found the time to draw her properly until the last minute, the idea for who she was and what her ability would be were ones that actually came about pretty soon after I thought of Bandy, so pretty early days which meant that I knew exactly what I wanted her to be for a while, but I just didn't know exactly what she was going to look like. The concept I had in mind for her was that she would be either the captain of like the active witch hunting scout kind of division of the jury, or some kind of bounty hunter. I also knew that I wanted her to have a very cool and like don't mess with me kind of powerful personality, and also I wanted her to be cowboy themed. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure the only reason for that was because uh, I thought it would be fun, but you know, sometimes that's all you need. Knowing that I wanted her to be this formidable witch hunter slash bounty hunter character, uh, it made coming up with her ability pretty easy. Her power is hunting and tracking, which manifests in a couple of different ways. Primarily as a bullseye kind of homing bullet ability where she can mark things with a target and then her bullets will curve around corners to be able to hit it with perfect accuracy. And then she can also use that target to track the people she's hunting over long distances. Besides that, I think I'd kind of like it to have some kind of trapping capability, but that's mostly because the visual of a bear trap and a net and stuff would look really cool as a power for a hunter. Based on that theme of hunting and sharpshooting anyway, um, I did a bit of research and decided to name her Diana Shikari. Back on the mythology train, if you're familiar with your ancient history um, and mythology, you'll probably already be aware that uh, Diana is the Roman equivalent of Artemis, who is the Greek goddess of the hunt. Diana also just sounds really dignified as a name, so that matched up really nicely with the kind of personality that I knew I wanted her to have. And Shikari, her second name, is apparently another word for hunter. Thank you once again to the thesaurus for that one. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned before when I was talking about Bandy that this was another one of the characters that I had a really tough time deciding on a colour palette for, mostly because she was one of the last villains to be designed and I wanted to make sure that her sort of costume and appearance uh, looked good with everybody else on the team. I was pretty stuck for a while, but when I was looking more into the mythology of the goddess Diana, I found out that apparently she had a golden bow and arrow. And then, of course, I thought, oh, well, this character would look really cool with a golden gun. You know, with the cowboy theme and everything. Plus, a black and gold palette would look so classy and work so well for the kind of badass, powerful lady vibe that I really want her to have. And then, taking further inspiration from Diana, I also gave her cowboy poncho a cape serape thing? I'm, you know, I'm not entirely sure what it's called, but whatever it is, uh, <laughs> I gave it edges that look similar to the skirt of a Roman soldier. There are a lot of different themes that went into this character, but I think they all came together in a really fun way. Um, <laughs> At some point during the process, I also got reminded that Diana is associated with the moon, which I got really excited about because, like I said before, I wanted these villains to parallel the heroes in certain ways. For Diana, I imagined her as a foil to Flint, because he fights at close range and she's obviously long-ranged with her gun, and you know, that could be an interesting matchup. 
but now they have an extra thematic parallel because after hearing that trivia, I decided to give Diana a moon motif to parallel Flint's sun motif. We, we love layers in this house, we love depth. Uh, <laughs> anyway, after deciding that she was going to have that gold colour scheme, I also decided that I wanted her costume to have a lot of gold detailing and embellishments. And although I am very happy with how those embellishments ended up looking, it did also mean that drawing her took the longest time out of any of these villains. Her costume is so detailed, I don't know why I always do this to myself. Um, <laughs> to be fair, it's not like Diana is the only one who's super detailed, um, I'm pretty sure all of these villains are, are kind of guilty of that. Um, <laughs> So, probably their designs might be liable to change in the future, um, I might need to simplify them a bit, because otherwise it's just going to take me just fucking forever every time I want to draw them. That's their real evil superpower, it's just how long they all take to draw. Anyway, putting the uh, ridiculous amount of detail in this design to one side for a second, uh, <laughs> although Diana was one of the last characters to get a visual design, she actually wasn't the final member of this team. So let's move along and take a look at the actual last villain. Alrighty, so this last guy is definitely another one of my favourites, so I'm very excited to talk about him. And uh, actually, I posted a preview a couple days ago of the sketch I did for him in this drawing, and there were so many comments from people being like, is he single? So, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm doubly excited to be able to finally share him with you all in his entirety. Um, I hope he lives up to that enthusiasm, I really do. Uh, <laughs> So, where do I even begin with this guy? Um, his name is Lance, uh, Lance Lothair, and uh, Voltron fandom down in the comments. Um, I know you might have gotten a bit excited there for a second hearing that name, but I'm going to preemptively ask you to stop typing what you're about to type about your favourite Voltron man, because I promise there's no correlation. Um, <laughs> Anyway, no, um, no harm meant by that, by the way, I'm fully taking the piss. Um, <laughs> but his name actually came from Lancelot, uh, a character in the legend of King Arthur. Because Lance here was inspired by the idea of a knight. More specifically, the character of the Black Knight, who is basically this evil knight dressed in black armour who appears in various different legends and myths. I really wanted one of these villains to be someone who specialised in using swords and various weapons like that, and for some reason the idea that came into my head right away was this very unchivalrous knight with a wild and unruly personality who just really, really enjoys fighting. And to be honest, who probably only joined the jury in the first place so that he could fight more people. I don't think Lance has any real disdain for people who use magic, he just wants the chance to fight strong people, um, and he doesn't care how he has to go about doing that, even if it's very underhanded. Because of that hot-headed, bloodthirsty kind of nature of his, Lance is very much the attack dog of this team of villains, and his ability helps him to make sure that he is well equipped to take down any opponent that he might face. You see, when I first came up with Lance, I knew I wanted him to be some kind of weapon summoner, kind of like Urza from Fairy Tale. But then the more I thought about the legends that inspired his design, the more I started to connect a couple of dots. Kind of like, okay, knights. Knights use weapons, and they use those weapons to fight dragons, and dragons hoard treasure. And then I thought, hmm, I suppose to Lance, a collection of weapons would be like a hoard of treasure. And then I had uh, a bit of a moment of clarity where I was like, now hold on, I might be onto something here. <laughs> so I decided to mix those ideas, those traits together, and Lance's ability ended up being that he can hoard weapons. Specifically, he can steal weapons right out of other people's hands and add them to his collection. And once they're in his collection, his hoard, he can summon those weapons for his own use and instantly switch them out as he pleases. He's basically able to arm himself for combat by instantly disarming all of his opponents. Actually, there's a video series on YouTube called UALA, which is this live-action My Hero Academia spin-off made by a bunch of stuntmen. And there's a character in that who can turn weapons into other weapons. And the visual they use in that of, like, a sword turning into a spear mid-swing is exactly how I imagine Lance's ability looking in motion. It's very cool if you haven't seen it, you should, you should check it out. Now, as you can see here, Lance doesn't wear his Black Knight armor all the time, because for one thing, you know, he can equip it as and when he wants to in the middle of a fight, and it could be like a cool power-up move to put the full armor on, kind of like when Zoro puts on his headband in One Piece. But also because, like, I didn't, I didn't want to draw a full suit of armor. That's that's hard. I don't, I, I'm not good at that. Uh, <laughs> 
but I did include the helmet so you can at least see how the design of his armor ended up kind of combining those influences of like the Black Knight from mythology with, you know, uh, the kleptomaniac tendencies of an angry dragon. Um, <laughs> I also uh, tried to give the sword he's holding a bit of a monstrous dragony kind of look by giving it a serrated edge to mimic the appearance of sharp teeth, as well as a scaled kind of spiral wrapping around the hilt. Also, while we're on the topic of what he looks like, I decided to give Lance an orange and black colour scheme because Lance was made as the villainous opposite for Ira, and obviously orange and blue are direct opposites on the colour wheel. Where Ira is a good knight, Lance is an evil one. Where Ira can make things with his magic, Lance can steal them away. Where Ira takes the role of a hero, Lance takes on the mantle of a monster. Lance is basically the embodiment of what Ira could have become if he'd taken a slightly different path in life. And that is a very fun dynamic to think about when imagining how a fight between the two of them might go. I think that's one of the things I enjoy the most about Lance, actually, is imagining his dynamics with other characters. Because, like, he's so headstrong and, like, brash that it's, it's very interesting to think of uh, how he might converse with other people. Um, I haven't talked much in this video about just how each of these villains would interact with each other, but uh, obviously they're all part of the same team, so if you would like a bit of trivia on that front, I think Lance and Bandy would get paired up a lot for certain missions, with Bandy acting <laughs> kind of like uh, Lance's minder, so he pulls him off of the battlefield when he's done going into a frenzy, uh, and those two get along pretty well as it goes. And as for the rest of their colleagues, um, I'll leave that up to your imagination. Anyway, speaking of the rest of them, uh, Lance here is just about finished, so let's go ahead and take a look at them all together. Well, there we have it. A dastardly bunch of villains that were honestly a whole lot of fun to put together. As ever, I hope that you enjoyed seeing these designs and hearing me ramble about them. I could be wrong, but I think this is on track to be the longest video I've ever made. So yeah, if you're still here, well done, and uh, thank you. I know I said as much last time, but I really, really love this story, so I always appreciate getting the chance to just go absolutely off on one and talk about it like this, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to think that you guys maybe enjoyed it too. Uh, <laughs> if any of the characters or concepts in this video really did stand out to you and get your imagination fired up, or maybe if you have suggestions for things that you'd like to see in a future edition of Concept Corner, be it more heartless stuff or anything else, please do let me know down in the comments. Like I said at the beginning, the last one of these got a ton of comments and it really meant the world to see. I read through every single one and they were all really, really sweet. So I would really appreciate hearing your thoughts on this one as well. So yeah, please do let me know your faves, let me know your theories, let me <laughs> let me know who you're simping for. I don't know, whatever you want to do. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go because this video took a very long time to make and I think I need a nap. So for now, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you're all staying as safe, happy, and healthy as you possibly can, and I will see you all next time. <laughs>